Hey, good morning, City Church. Uh, so good to be with you this morning. I want to share something that's been rocking my world with you lately. If you go with me to uh, Luke chapter 11, no, Luke chapter 10, I should know where I'm at. Um, it's the story where the lawyer stands up and he puts Jesus to the test saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit life? And Jesus replied, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And the lawyer answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbors yourself. And the Lord replied, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. We, we often preach this pretty heavy-handedly to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, as if it's something that we can actually accomplish. But you see, what Jesus was doing is he was fulfilling the law on his time on earth. He was fulfilling every dot, every iota, not a single one would fall. He fulfilled it all. He was perfect. He became our replacement because we never could accomplish those things. And so when we tend to teach that that's still the goal that we're supposed to have, it puts, it puts a cheapness on the grace and the power of God, um, what he's trying to do in us. You see, God wants us to come and receive his love. We, the Apostle John writes in 1 John that we love because he first loved us. And so it's not on us to go and love God with all our heart, with all our soul strength and might, with all our mind. See, that's me exerting myself towards God. And that's not how it flows. That's the old flow of the Old Testament, trying to reach God with my good works. But in the new covenant, because of Jesus, God reaches down and he fills us with himself so we can accomplish all that he called us to, that we could be like him as we were created to be through the power of his Holy Spirit, not by the power of my heart, my soul, my strength, or my mind. And so we see in Ephesians, if you were to jump to Ephesians, Paul lays out the power of the gospel in Ephesians so quickly. In the first three chapters, he lays out exactly what Jesus did for us. You, you don't find anything for us to do as in control and force out of our own will. He is constantly talking about all that Christ did, his grace as a gift that he uses over and over again about what Jesus did, saying things like having your, the, I pray that the eyes of your hearts would be enlightened, that you may know the hope to which you were called, the riches of the glorious inheritance you have in the saints, and what is the measurable greatness of his power towards you, Those for those of us who believe. And then he goes on to say in chapter two of Ephesians that, look, we were all living in the passion of our flesh, every single one of us carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we're by nature sons of wrath. When none of us had this together, none of us had the ability to love God. So why would God call, why would Jesus call us to that? See, that what Jesus did on the cross and resurrecting from the grave, he took care of all of that. It's an old flow to try to think that I in any way have anything to offer to please God by pressing my will, pressing my, even my heart, my greatest desires are, are, are torn in my flesh. But because of of Jesus and the power of his Holy Spirit in me, I can love God because he filled me with love. That the greatest commandment isn't fulfilled by me trying to love God. It's fulfilled by me receiving the love of God. That the flow is reversed because God is so good. His righteousness is shown by his goodness towards us while we were still sinners, while we were enemies of Christ, while we were stuck in our sin. God poured out his love through his son for us. And so it says that you, by grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated. You have been seated. It's already been done. It's not something for you to accomplish. But you've been seated in heavenly places so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness, his unmerited favor and his goodness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, by his favor, you have been saved through faith, not, not, your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. Oh my gosh. And then he ends it with this, this triumphant declaration that we would understand what we need to receive in Christ, not what we would need to work towards in Christ. And he says this, therefore, oh, excuse me. And I'll switch over to chapter three. He, he keeps going on this, this time. And he goes into this in verse 14, chapter three. For this reason, I bow my knees before the father from whom every family in heaven on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit, not your spirit, not your mind or strength, in your inner being, so that you 
so that you may understand, so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. To him who is able to do far more than you could ever imagine or think, due to his power at work within us, to him be the glory in Christ Jesus through the church. Amen. God wants his love to be received. He does, he's not calling us to love him out of our own strength. He's calling us to just sit in awe and humility and, and just receive in faith his love. And out of that, he will do the work through his power, not yours. Be blessed today. Receive the love of God toward you and know that God is pleased because he loves you.